Good evening and welcome to the Coon Rapids City Council meeting for Tuesday, May 21st, 2019. If you could please join us and rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Councilmember Guskoviak? Here. Councilmember Kicker? Here. Councilmember Demmer? Here. Councilmember Geyser? Here. Councilmember Johnson? Here. Councilmember Wells? Here. Mayor Cook? Here. Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda is to adopt this evening's agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Demmer, second by Kicker to adopt the agenda. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And the agenda is adopted. And the very first item on our agenda this evening, we are going to welcome the Coon Rapids women of today here. And the Coon Rapids women of today have set aside June 23rd to recognize the many activities of dedicated women of today across the state and have asked the city to declare June 23rd Coon Rapids women of today day. So if you ladies would like to come up, I will meet you out in front of the dais. Shirts and everything, yeah. nice. <laughs> well, welcome. Maybe you can introduce yourself and then I'll read the proclamation here. Thank you. I'm Beth Clifford and I am our membership vice president. I'm Jenny Orr and I'm one of the co presidents. I'm Sherry Boyk and I'm the state delegate. Well, whereas the Minnesota women of today and the Coon Rapids women of today have set aside June 23rd, to recognize the many community activities of dedicated women of today across the state, and whereas women of today believe that through us, great lessons can be learned, worthy deeds performed, and a hand of fellowship extended to millions of women everywhere, and whereas the Minnesota women of today and the Coon Rapids women of today are dedicated to actively promoting such public awareness and service programs as the Minnesota Milk Bank for Babies, Wishes and More, Breaking Free, True Friends slash Camp Friendship, and the March of Dimes, as well as projects, educational programs, and fundraisers for the Coon Rapids area, such as a yearly Santa shop, Back to School Drive, and the Coon Rapids Chili Challenge, and whereas the Minnesota women of today and the Coon Rapids women of today provide personal enrichment and leadership training for members of all ages, and now, therefore, I, Jerry Cook, Mayor of the City of Coon Rapids, on behalf of the Coon Rapids City Council, hereby proclaim June 23rd, 2019 to be Coon Rapids Women of Today Day in the City of Coon Rapids, proclaimed this 21st day of May, 2019. Awesome. Now, tell us what you're about. Tell us what's maybe going on, or somebody just give us a little quick synopsis, or you don't have to. I can't make it. <laughs> So uh, we are about service, growth, and fellowship. So we um, form friendships and um, reach out into the community and try and, and find some needs where we can, we can fill. And um, then that's about it. And help all these other groups. Yes, <laughs> as much as we can. <laughs> and make great chili. From what I remember, last year you won the uh, chili challenge. Do we have, are you going to sign that or do we have to wait for Joan or what do we think? Okay, all right. And the proclamation will actually be ready to go here. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for everything. Is there anything else? No, that's it. That's great. Okay, Thank perfect. You Thank, Thank you. you. Next item on our agenda is to approve the minutes of the May 7th, 2009, or 2019 meeting. So moved. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Wells. 
Um, any discussion or corrections? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. That motion, that motion carries two abstentions, Johnson and Demmer. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six items on our consent agenda this evening. The first is to approve the temporary on sale strong beer and wine liquor license for 4th of July community celebration to the Coon Rapids North Star Lions. And I love how the middle name is, or the middle of it, Stephen A. Wells, on behalf of the Coon Rapids North Star Lions, has applied for a temporary on sale strong beer and wine liquor license to be used at the 4th of July community celebration to be located at the Coon Rapids Ice Center slash Boulevard Plaza, 11,000 Crooked Lake Boulevard on July 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, 2019. The appropriate fees have been paid, the certificate of insurance for liquor liability is on file, and the background investigation has been completed and approved, I might add, by the police department. The, uh, the temporary on sale strong beer and wine liquor license will be valid from 8 a.m. to midnight from July 2nd through July 4th, 2019. So with this, we'll be approving the temporary strong beer and wine liquor license for the Coon Rapids North Star Lions for use at the 4th of July community celebration from July 2nd through July 4th, 2019. Next item on the agenda is to approve the waiver of fees for the 4th of July celebration. We will be approving the waiver of the fireworks display, carnival, 5K, 10K run, walk, and parade license fees for the 2019 4th of July celebration. Um, five. Uh, then we're looking to adopt resolution 19, uh, this is item five on our, on our agenda tonight. Uh, we're looking to adopt resolution 19-51, accepting donations of funds from the Coon Rapids Mortgage Assistance Foundation Home Improvement Foundation. Um, and I'm just going to read this because it's really actually quite exciting. The Coon Rapids, well, at least I think it's exciting. Yeah, you know. exciting. <laughs> the Coon Rapids Mortgage Assistance Foundation created a new exterior curb appeal grant program at their December 2018 meeting. This program was named the Front Door Grant Program and was meant to serve as a pilot program with an initial budget of $100,000. The Front Door Grant Program was kicked off at the city's annual North Suburban Home Improvement Show in March and was on the front page of the city's newsletter later in the month. Funds were available on a first-come, first-served basis. Over 300 applications were received by the end of April, and all of the initial funds were quickly committed. Staff met with the Coon Rapids Mortgage Assistance Foundation Board on May 2nd, to review the activity in the Front Door Grant Program and to request additional funding, the board approved $150,000 to be allocated from their board-operated 82,000 fund. Uh, since these funds are being transferred, uh, the city needs to be, um, the city must first accept this donation of funds. I, I guess it's just so key that this program is so successful and there was that many people that applied for it and that's just amazing. And it's grants for the front of the home, it's for the driveways, it's for exterior improvements, things that improve the curb appeal. Can I just ask a quick question? On that? Sure, Brad. So it, my question is, is this 150000 over and above the initial 100000 Yes. So we're talking about an investment of 200 and a quarter of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yep. So um, thank you, Councilmember Johnson. So with this, we'll be adopting Resolution 19-51, accepting $150,000 of Coon Rapids Mortgage Assistance Foundation grant dollars to be used in the city's new front door grant program. So cool. Um, item six, we're looking to approve the cooperative agreement for public safety and security for the 2019 3M Open. Uh, the 2019 3M Open is coming to the city of Blaine on June 28th through July 7th. And the event and related social events require a significant security presence that is beyond the capability of the City of Blaine Police Department. The attached cooperative agreement outlines the rights and responsibilities of each party. So basically the scheduling of Coon Rapids officers for security services will only be done in a manner so as to not impact the safety and security of Coon Rapids. There will, be, there will also be no impact to the city budget as police expenses will be submitted for reimbursement once the event is over through funds provided by the 3M Open. So uh, we're looking at entering into a cooperative agreement to provide public safety and security related to the 2019 3M Open and related events. Item seven on this evening's agenda 
is to adopt Resolution 19-52, setting a hearing for miscellaneous assessments, 2019 um, sub 1, I guess, parentheses 1. Um, well, let's see. We are going to be setting, uh, the Board of Adjustment and Appeals is expected to conduct a, all right, let's just start at the beginning. The City Council must set a public hearing as required by state statutes. At that hearing, the City Council may refer appellants to the Board of Adjustment and Appeals, and the Board of Adjustment and Appeals will then give their recommendation. This is, this is to consider miscellaneous assessments to be certified to the county for collection with the 2020 property taxes. The Board of Adjustment and Appeals is expected to conduct this hearing on July 11th and make a recommendation to the City Council at the August 7th Council meeting. Staff will incorporate the process in the required mailing to the property owner. These assessments include services provided to taxpayers, in most cases code enforcement violations. The terms of repayment are determined by the amount being assessed. The proposed assessments are categorized by the number of years to be assessed and the interest rate recommended. So we'll be adopting Resolution 19-52, Miscellaneous Assessment, Declaring the Cost to be Assessed, Ordering Preparation of the Proposed Assessment Roll, and Ordering the Public Hearing for June 4th, 2019 on the Proposed Assessment Roll. Um, item 8 is to accept a right of entry agreement with e &R Investment LLC. Um, e &R Investments LLC received site plan approval on November 20th, 2018 for construction of a new indoor self-storage facility, which is to be located at 220 101st Avenue. Uh, the right of entry uh, agreement allows the city to periodically enter the property to exercise hydrants, valves, and to flush the water main system. The utility system within the site is considered private, and the property owner will continue to own and maintain it. This right of entry agreement simply provides the city the ability to ensure appropriate fire protection. So with this will be accepting the attached right of entry agreement with ENR Investments LLC for their new self storage facility at 220 101st Avenue, Lot 2, Block 1, Cardinal Heights, Plat 2. And item 9, which is our last item on our consent agenda, is to accept a right of entry agreement with Green Bay Packaging. Green Bay Packaging received site plan approval on March 21st, 2019 for the construction of a 100,500 square foot expansion to the existing facility located at 555 87th Lane. The right of entry agreement allows the city to periodically enter the property to exercise hydrants, valves, and to flush the water main system. The utility system within the site is considered private and the property owner will continue to own and maintain it. And this right of entry agreement, just like the last one, simply provides the city the ability to ensure appropriate fire protection. So this last item on our consent agenda will be to accept the attached right of entry agreement with Green Bay Packaging <laughs> Incorporated for its facility located at 555 87th Lane. And that's the consent agenda. Your Honor. Council Member Johnson. I'll move approval of all items on the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Johnson and a second by Demmer. Any discussion or questions? Council Member Demmer? I just walked past somebody who had done the front door program and their new driveway looks really nice compared to the old driveway. So uh, just another endorsement that that program is making things look better. Everything's happening right around you. You get a home for generations. I know. Across the I get to go front door next door. The first and time I've ever been in that neighbor's house. It looks beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Member well, on the same topic, I'd just like to point out that if my math is correct, that 250000 will generate about a million five in improvements in the city. Yeah, it's awesome. It's, it's, it's an absolutely tremendous program. It's just, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, any other discussion or questions about the consent agenda? Comments? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And the consent agenda is adopted. Item 10 this evening is to consider an emergency mill and overlay repair on Exeva Street, Project 19-18. And uh, this is the one that was brought to my attention by my UPS driver. <laughs> what are you guys going to do about Exeva Street? And uh, you were already on it. So um, anything you want to hit on this or do um, you want me to read the discussion points or... Mr. Mayor, members of the council, it's just to do a, an overlay on the roadway, uh, to save a whole lot of time and money on patching and personnel costs. 
Uh, it's not an assessment uh, situation for the homeowners. We're going to fund it out of our street maintenance program, and we have extra dollars um, due to a, a lighter program with seal coat and fog sealing this year. Happy to answer any questions. All right. What's, what's the scope of this project, and in, in, do we have like a distance in miles or a half mile, quarter mile? Do we know what it is? I'm just curious because to get this done for $145,000 to get a really a good road there again, that's that's a pretty seems like a pretty good deal yeah. compared to the rest of the numbers we're looking at. <laughs> With this one, Mr. Mayor, you have it's all the way from Coon Rapids Boulevard to uh, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, what you have right now is nobody is prepared to do paving work so right you got to get the concrete work done you got to get the utility work done so you've got contractors that are sitting waiting so the other work gets finished so they they're in working on other projects throughout the city but there's nothing ready to be paved yet so they've they've got the equipment they've got the supplies they got everything they need to do it they just don't have any work to do so if we catch them now before the beginning, and that's why we put a short window on this, and it'll be done presumably by the end of next week, right after Memorial Day, that, that was the price we got to be done at that period of time. So it's, it's a three, four day project for them. They get their paycheck, they move on to a different part of the city and, and continue their work. So, suddenly I'd like to do a mill and overlay on a lot of stuff and maybe hold off on 19.2. <laughs> <laughs> we missed the window. We missed the window. Oh, okay. Councilor <laughs> Kicker? So are, what is the depth of the pavement? I mean, it must be such that we're, you know, we, we're able to do a mill and overlay on this then? That's, that's correct. Council Member Kicker, we did, we did several uh, pavement cores, about a dozen pavement cores up and down the corridor. We measured the thickness and it was about five and a half inches throughout. So an inch and a half is what we're proposing to do, and that will be uh, adequate for the pavement section that is there. And, and what is our new standard that we're moving to? Well, typically our, our local streets we're reconstructing with three inches of asphalt total, and that's fine for the neighborhood streets, local streets. Um, collector streets like Zavis or, or X Zavis is a, are, are, are four inches minimum. <laughs> Zion, Xion, Xavis, Xavis. Xavis. Council Member um, Griscoviak. I have a question. I know it's an emergency repair. Uh, Mr. Himmer mentioned that there's no assessments for this mill and overlay. Is that typical of all mill and overlays? If, there's, if we were just going to do a mill and overlay budgeted, there's an assessment process? Council Member Griscoviak, yes. We, we instituted that as an assessment uh, two or three years ago. That was added as kind of half the cost of your standard assessment because mm -hmm. you're getting about half the life expectancy of it. And since this road was reconstructed in the past 19, 20 years, um, and because we've already gone through <laughs> the assessment period of time and everything else that's out there, it. If we wanted to go that route, we'd be starting with public hearings and notices, and it, it, we'd be ending up paying the prices that we're paying on some of our other jobs uh, to go through the public bidding process, even if we get bidders on it. Got it. All right. Thanks for the clarification. Councilmember okay. Geiser? Well, I certainly am excited. I probably have gotten more calls on the Davis Street, but it's just been a mess. So um, I think there will be a lot of happy residents once this is done. Were you, was that a motion? I will make <laughs> sure. Are we ready? Okay. I think so. I thought there was a public, did we have to do a public hearing here? No? Nope. Okay. Um, I will make a motion to adopt resolution 19-18 sub 9, awarding a contract to Northwest Asphalt in the amount of $145,073.28 for an emergency improvement by mill and overlay of Xavis Street from Coon Rapids Boulevard to Mississippi Boulevard. Awesome. Second. Go ahead. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Kicker. Any discussion? Hearing I'm none. Oh, what? I'm sorry. Councilor I just Kicker. wanted to add, when, when, are we, when would this start? And how soon? We would try to start as soon as possible, uh, late this week, uh, most likely next week, and then into the following week. So right after. Let Memorial Day pass yep. and hit it that week. Yeah. Weather dependent. Yeah. Yeah. OK. <laughs> soon. All right. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Um, under new business, item 11 is to consider introduction of ordinances for code revisions related to multi-unit recycling collection. Uh, Mr. Fernelius or, or 
Does anybody want a presentation from Ms. Sinclair or anything? Or Mr. Stemwell, we're just going for it. Do you want me to read this description or what? Well, Mayor Council, uh, <laughs> Ms. Sinclair uh, certainly can provide a summary if the council would like. Um, okay, um, so this is something, this really isn't a, a, a large step off. I mean, this is just kind of cleaning up some mm -hmm. stuff and we've workshopped this. And um, before we introduce it, I, I just had a question if I could just figure out what I did with it. Um, item 11, come on, let's get back to item 11. Um, so I, I guess in the, in the introduction, it talks about the recycling quantity standard set at 10 gallons per unit per week. And um, then later it talks about minimum weekly service capacity of 0 0.05 cubic yards per dwelling, per dwelling unit. Um, I, I guess the, the, in the ordinance it just talks about cubic yards, correct? It doesn't talk about gallons? I'm sorry. I thought I had this figured out. But I, I keep skipping around. Um, all right, well, let's get to my other question then because I can't even figure out how to get my arms around that. Um, number D, um, under 7, it says, For multi-unit residential uses, centralized collection, the city will adopt a policy and requirements, and then A, B, C, and then D, is such policy will be kept on file in the office of the director. Who, what does that mean? Who's the director, and do they have a file for everybody in their drawer? Or I don't understand that. Your Honor. Mr. Brody? I can explain. Um, we do define director within the Chapter 8, the waste, man, or waste collection ordinance, and it's uh, the public works director, Mr. Hammer. And so that's, it references that, and that's why it uses the same term, because he's defined as the director under, under that. And so he, he being the over. Um, overseeing Colleen and her department. Obviously, she'd have a copy of it. It would be made available, It'd probably be on her website. Okay. So the city will adopt a policy. In, so that, so it's, okay, so it's the city's policy that he'll have it in his drawer. Okay, all right, never mind. <laughs> I'm okay. Does anybody have any questions on this? Or just my confusing things? Sorry. No, I'm going to start referring to Mr. Himmer as either the director or overseer. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, Councilor you know, I, I think you know it's just cleaning up language, making things um, in alignment in a couple of different places, and and starting to have a standard for recycling at multi-unit, um, which I think is a good thing. It's you know we're not overly aggressive with it. Um, you know people are pretty close to all doing that already, um, but. It's just showing that that's an important thing that the city cares about, um, and that we should be doing at all of our locations. So, it's you know it, it's nice to have this cleaned up. It's nice to have, you know, some guidelines, but this is still I I, I find myself looking in recycling bins, in recycling dumpsters or whatever they are. It, it, we do a terrible job of recycling. You know, recycling is tied up in plastic bags, and there's things in there you're going, you can't recycle. Oh. You know, so it's, it's like this whole, this container thing, it's probably good. It's good to have guidelines, but it's still the education is really the key. And somehow, and, and this includes educating, so hopefully that ramps up and works. Um, Council Member Demmer? To, to drive a point on that, I um, had seen an article recently that our recycling as Americans is so dirty that the old policy of shipping it to China on a boat to have them clean it up has gone bad because they no longer take recycling from America because we put so much food and other junk in our recycling. And so we do all this work to try to recycle stuff and it ends up in the garbage anyway because we put so much other junk in there. So for a little while Malaysia was taking it and now they won't take it either. <laughs> and so your, your point is well taken. If, you know, if we want to actually do something with our recycling, we, we we have to pay a little more attention to what we throw in there and, and not assume it's going to get sorted out. That said, I, I think this, uh, this ordinance makes sense. You know, it, it's setting a minimum bar that's maybe slightly above where we are, but it meets, to me, the, the goal of um, the state law that says everyone must have access to recycling 
And I think you do need a minimum standard to really call it access legitimately. All right. Um, okay. So if there's no other questions or comments, then we will consider ordinance. The ordinance amending city codes 8-214 sub 7, 8-215 sub 2, 12-914 sub 5, related to multi-unit recycling collection introduced. And if, you're, if this impacts you, I suggest you go to and look at the council packet and see what it looks like because there's a lot of stuff there. Um, all right, item 12. Um, consider introduction of an ordinance to add 2-1200 reasonable accommodation. Um, Mr. Brody, anything you want to hit on this? It um, just looks like it creates a policy that we needed that we didn't have. It creates not only a policy but a process, and it's sort of outlined in the ordinance itself, um, the standards that it'll, an application will be made to a staff. We've actually created that application so we get the information that we want. Staff will review that. Um, it'll be brought for the council to make the decision. They, uh, people will be notified um, that are adjacent to the property if necessary. And so we're just looking for an introduction tonight. Obviously, we anticipate we probably will get an application because that's why we're putting this together. But at this point, we're just putting the process in place uh, to do just that. Okay. And based, for to be frank, it's based on similar uh, processes that other cities have adopted. Okay. And for context, the Fair Housing Act determines that reasonable accommodations in housing must be made to those with qualifying disabilities. The FHA protects those who are recovering from substance abuse, are not actively using, and are working to achieve long-term sobriety. These persons are considered to have a disability under the FHA and are, and are a protected class. The FHA applies to cities um, and its land use and zoning laws or practices. Therefore, in some cases, a locality must make a reasonable accommodation to those who are classified as having a disability, thus allowing equal opportunity to housing under the FHA. And now this, we've got the application, and if this eventually passes, then we'll have the process. Correct. All right. Does anybody have any questions on this? Council Member Johnson? Your Honor. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Brody, there, and I passed on some of these comments to the city manager as well. I, I like that we're doing a process. I appreciate that the list that is there of uh, considerations or the factors under which we're going to evaluate this is a, a non-exhaustive list. It's it, the very last one in paragraph 3G says any other factor that may have a bearing on the request, which is kind of general in nature. Um, it might be nice to include that the request shall be evaluated under the following, you know, non-exclusive factors or whatever just to make it even a little bit more clear but I did want to um, have you uh, consider whether we should have put in here something along the lines of whether um, the request creates any articulable um, public safety concern um, or risk to public safety I can envision certain situations where there might be a request to expand occupancy um, beyond a point where um, there is an articulable reason that risks public safety or uh, there could be other uh, considerations as well. So I'd be happy to talk to you about that. I don't know if that kind of change would require any alteration or whatever, but... I would think that it would fit in under my guess, and this is sort of a standard that's set out by a lot of case law that's been established and it's been used is that a fundamental alteration, I would argue, of city regulations, policies, and procedures. Right. And yeah. under that envelope. And so as we're considering, that's a fairly broad category as we're considering these applications. If something like that were to come up, that that would be what we'd be looking at or at number seven. Right. And I appreciate that. It's just that if you have the opportunity when you're creating a new sure. ordinance to be real clear that public safety is one of those things. and I, I get a little cautious on public safety in this realm, in this area of terms of, you know, they have, it has to be a direct threat and, mm -hmm. you know, you can't use, you know, rely on sort of, hey, the neighbors don't like it or they're concerned, you know. That's so, why I refer In to a it general as... sense. So, I, you know, I like, in some ways I like the generality of this because it does perhaps allow some flexibility, but I certainly appreciate your comments. And like I said, I don't think it would require a fundamental change if, if something brings something forward next time that would require us to reintroduce it. Okay. And, and I think that you still preserve those other arguments as well. Um, uh, 
And that's why I use the phrase articulable yeah. risk to public safety. It's not just that there is some general concern mm -hmm. for public safety. It's that there's a real articulable risk sure. that can be can be made. But I appreciate it, and I'm in support of the ordinance ultimately being drafted and, and uh, enacted. And Thank I wrote you. down the word and art articulable. That's a great word. <laughs> <laughs> if you can say it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was my first shot at it. Right. <laughs> I'll practice. I had to rehearse before I came in here. Uh, Mayor? Uh, Council Member Griscoviak? Will we see uh, uh, a request application form before I this? Sort of, I certainly can it. attach that to the next agenda. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Excellent. All right, well, with no further discussion, then we will consider um, ordinance to add chapter 2 1200 reasonable accommodation. Uh, let's see, well, I better just go from here. Um, we will consider um, adding uh, the ordinance to add chapter 2 1200 reasonable accommodation, which provides a process for requesting a reasonable accommodation under the Fair Housing Act. We will consider that introduced. And. Our last item under new business is to consider resolution 19-2 sub 9, awarding a contract for MSA street reconstruction project 19-2. And this is for Wedgwood Drive from Main Street to Round Lake Boulevard, Olive Street from Main Street to 121st Avenue, and Foley Boulevard from 124th Lane to 115th Avenue. Um, open house meetings were held last November and January. Um, and the next open house will be the neighborhood meeting to introduce the city and contractor project staff. But I suppose we should probably pay for this first, right? Um, anything we need, need to cover on this other than the bids came in really high? Um, we had we only had one bid on this project from Park Construction. Six point three six $6,309,719.80, which was about 20% 20, about 20 higher than what we were anticipating. Um, but uh, as it was explained, that's a product of tight, a tight labor market and escalating costs of uh, materials. And if we wait, we'll probably be looking at a higher amount. So. I'll stop talking. Does anybody have anything to want to add or ask or move? Your Honor. Councilmember Demmer? Yeah, we actually had a half hour meeting right before this meeting where this was what we talked about and, and that, that kind of is the punchline. There's no reason to believe that we're suddenly going to get a great discount if we wait and there are reasons to believe we would get a reverse discount if we wait. Um, so as, as it's a, a, a bit of a tough one to swallow but, uh, but everyone drives on these roads and and you can tell because they're in pretty rough shape. So I would move um, to adopt resolution 19-2 sub 9, awarding a contract to Park Construction Company in the amount of $6,309,719.80 for project 19-2. Second. Motion by Demmer, second by Kicker. Discussion? Your Honor. Council Member Johnson? I, I, you know, I know and we all know Park Construction will build a good set of roads in this project although because they were the only one and because they're getting this um, for uh, a significant amount of money let's make sure that, that it's a really good road um, <laughs> so, uh, Foley is just such an, an important artery for um, for the city it, it borders both Mr. Kicker's area and my area in the city and we this is our part of Foley the previous parts of Foley that have been improved have been the county's parts of the road this is our part and I would like to see this be a really nice road that'll stay nice for a long time so um, even though it's higher than what we had anticipated given the market I'm fully in support of moving forward with the project all right any other discussion Your Honor. Councilmember Kicker? Yeah, I would just like to add that uh, I'm fully in support of it as well. Uh, not only is it, you know, cost-wise, no guarantee that it's going to be any less if we wait, but if we wait, we're, <laughs> we're going to have to suffer with these roads. I, I drive Olive Street in, you know, into the uh, City Hall every time I come here, and 
that road is terrible. And you've got Sand Creek Elementary School. Mm -hmm. That's right there. So it's important that we do this. There's other improvements that are going to be made on Foley that are really important as well, like the crosswalk. There's been lots of uh, concerns about that um, speed on there. So they're doing some things to help that as well. So, Mr. Hansen. Mr. Mayor and Council, I'd like to just add that if Council elects to award the contract tonight, uh, staff will be sending out postcards for a neighborhood meeting that we'll have in Woodview Park to explain to residents frequently asked questions, uh, introduce them to the contractor, provide contact information, as well as schedules. Uh, everyone that lives on the project and is affected by it will get schedules and frequently asked questions, contact information in the mail within the next week, week and a half or so. And so is, is it going to be a different date than what you've got here? Because May, you've got May 29th we've here. Got May 29th, and I, I, think, I think we could probably make that work. We'll have to get postcards in the mail tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you are impacted by these roads, you are going to get a postcard, but get it in your calendar that there will be the uh, neighborhood meeting May 29th in Woodview Park which is the one over off Northdale and Olive Street there behind the church. That's correct. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I suppose we should probably vote on this. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And we are at open mic. Is anybody here to address council for open mic this evening? Anybody here for open mic? All right. Uh, we have one open mic response from a previous open mic, and uh, Mr. Bernard Schatz spoke at the open mic portion of the May 7th meeting, and he requested the city council reverse an increase in his quarterly utility bill that was related to the city's senior discount program. Um, he had been receiving the $16 quarterly discount on his utility bill. However, after a verification process, it was determined by city staff, determined by city staff, that he didn't qualify for this discount as he didn't meet the age requirement. Um, by way of background, the senior discount program was established by the city ordinance in 1995 and was intended to provide a 50% discount to seniors on their sanitary sewer charge. This program was modified in 1997 to reduce the discount to 35% for those seniors who qualified after December 1st, 1997. And the approach the city took toward billing sewer changed in 2012 to include a minimum charge for all residents plus an additional charge based on usage. The senior discount program was eliminated except for those who were grandfathered into the program, which was those born in 1935 or before. For those who remained eligible, a discount was applied to the water portion of their bill because the city's billing software didn't allow for a discount to be applied under the new sewer rate structure. Subsequent to those changes, the city has attempted to verify eligibility for the senior discount every two years. The verification process was conducted toward the end of 2018 and involved sending letters to over 372 accounts that were still noted as receiving the discount. As a part of this process, those who applied for the discount were asked to submit an application and to provide proof of their age in order to determine eligibility. As a result, there are currently 177 accounts that continue to receive the $16 um, discount. So I, I, my question from this actually is, so the change was made in 2012, but then in 2018, we went from 372 down to 177. How had we previously verified them to be old enough and then all of a sudden have half of them fall off with no policy changes in those six years? Yeah, Mr. Stemwell? Yeah, Mayor Council, there, there were a couple of things that happened. In, in previous uh, attempts to verify eligibility, apparently all that was done was a letter was sent and there was a form that the resident just signed off on and returned it to City Hall. The difference this time in 2018 was there's added requirement of verification of age, uh, driver's license, ID, something that verified age. Um, and so some of them, there were a number of reasons why people fell off. I think there was a, a minor amount of cases in which someone um, thought they were eligible, but turns out that they weren't, as was maybe the case with Mr. Schatz. Um, in several cases, it was a situation where 
their spouse had qualified, was maybe a few years older, had qualified, and in this case, uh, the remaining uh, homeowner did not. Um, there are other situations where maybe uh, children had moved into the house and uh, hadn't updated the utility bills, and so the parents were no longer there, and so they fell off. Some just never got returned, and without the verification, the discount was just removed, things like of that nature. So there's multiple reasons that uh, we went from 372 to 177. Okay. Um, then did you speak with Mr. Schatz, or did somebody, uh, or is he good with this? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Mayor and City Council, I did speak with him last week. Um, whether or not he's good with it, I guess I won't try to uh, point that out. I think he understood the situation, and essentially where I left it with him was, you know, under a current structure, there isn't, you know, that's the rate by ordinance that's been set. Actually, it's in by resolution. Our ordinance refers to the city council set it by resolution. Our resolution set the rates every so often, um, and, and the sewer hasn't been uh, changed for a couple of years. And so I did look back at when that was most recently set. And so at a staff level, we don't have options to def, you know, change the system after those rates have been set. And so it's something that if the council was interested in looking at this program a little more uh, deeply as we look at our next sewer and water changes, that'd probably be the appropriate time to uh, reconsider the program or otherwise. I think ultimately the reason we've been trying to get away from the senior discount program is there's a certain amount of basic infrastructure that all residents should be contributing toward uh, replacement of said infrastructure. And in this case, when we move to a different system in the sewer structure where you're paying a base fee plus a, a fee based on usage, the theory was that seniors or those who have fewer people in the house will be paying a smaller fee because now it's at least proportionally based on usage. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a family of 10 or a single person, your bill will be considerably less because we're tracking that flow. And so at that time, the goal I believe, as this was a little before my time at the city or right around when I started, was to slowly get away from that senior discount uh, we have gone, the number actually was considerably higher than 372 um, over your past. I don't know if Fran recalls that number specifically, it was but. Over 1,000. Yeah. Oh. So we've actually gone from over 1,000 down to 177 over the last probably four years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Wells? I was wondering if you have any way of knowing the situation where uh, a spouse was old enough to qualify, and, and I know that was you know, the case in, in one person that was complaining about this, never left the home, and now, you know, the surviving spouse is like a year too young. It just doesn't seem like there would be that many of those situations. Um, I don't want to go back to the senior discount, but these people that have been in their homes for 50, 60 years, and now we're just finding out that, you know, in one case, she was a year too young. I think that may be the case for this gentleman also. but. But they've got it legitimately because the spouse was there and, you know, met the age requirement. I just, out of those hundred and some, I can't believe there's that many that have been in their homes for that long and qualify. It just seems like we can make an exception for those people. Mayor Council, I do believe there are a few situations like that. Maybe our finance director could recall if there was more than a handful. Uh, in most instances, there was just a handful of those. Most of them were the people had moved. We looked at the property records from Anoka County to try to determine who was living in the home. Um, very rarely was it because a spouse had passed away. Um, so I could check on the numbers, but I'm sure it's, it's under a dozen for sure. There weren't very many in that case. Your Honor. Councilmember <laughs> Johnson. No, I, I actually... Um, Agree significantly with Councilmember Wells. I mean, it, it seems to be fundamentally unfair to, in essence, dequalify or to penalize somebody uh, just because their spouse passed away. And if it is that small an impact, um, indeed, I'd I'd like staff to look at whether there can be some appropriate kind of um, procedure for how to deal with that or. Or some kind of, and if it requires council action, it requires council action. But um, to deal with those small and unique circumstances, but I'm fully in support of if there's new ownership in the house, 
you know, there should be. A lot of instances were that people just didn't respond to the letter. Sure. So I really wouldn't have any idea of those that didn't respond. Mm -hmm. Only those that would have come in with their ID that got denied, would we would know. Right. In most instances, if they didn't feel they qualified or they didn't notice it or I don't, I'm not going to say care, but they just didn't answer the letter and so they were removed. So okay. I'm not really sure there's a good process to do that, but we can certainly explore it. Sure. I wasn't thinking, I, I, I concur, I wasn't thinking you would go out and seek all of the ones that didn't respond, <laughs> Thank you. But, the, but I think that there are a few of those isolated ones that yeah. it, it, it just doesn't seem fair. Yeah, but, Robert and you mentioned that um, you know, if it seemed like something we'd be interested in talking more about, maybe it goes to a work session. I, I think that's enough people to say we should do something along those lines. I mean, just, just quick math. Pulled about 200 people off. It's quarterly bill. It's $16. It's $13,000 that the city saved by pulling 200 people off. We just spent a million dollars extra on a road. Um, if 20 of them were in the spouse situation, that's a thousand two hundred dollars a year. I mean, it's it's not worth the disappointment and the hassle to to you know, especially for that spouse clause. So I I think we could probably very quickly come to agreement on the situations that we would like to continue to grandfather. And again, I do really appreciate your context of we change the rules so now you're charged by amount of water you use so using less water is your discount. That makes me feel a lot better about the other 200. So I, I think that helps, but you know, maybe we should talk about it. Mr. Stemmer. Council, we, we can certainly look into it a little deeper. Um, obviously this particular method is a fairly blunt instrument the resolution the code is set up as a fairly blunt instrument and uh, certainly wasn't a case where we were targeting any particular groups it's just been the effort every other year to to verify who qualifies yeah. um, because we have found each time we've done that mostly because people move or don't respond or think life circumstances have changed that they don't qualify uh, in this case with the, the deceased spouse and the remaining spouse um, unfortunately, I think that was a scenario that just wasn't anticipated with this one instrument, and right. it's something we could look at. So. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I think we really spent some time on that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> About $50 a minute. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And we are at other business. Mr. Hammer, what was our final numbers on, uh, on Saturday? That was a very good open house for considering the weather. Uh, yeah, the public it was, works. Uh, quite surprising, Mr. Mayor. Um, we had about 210, 215, somewhere okay. in that well, ballpark. So a little down from last year. They but all came early. Um, tried to beat the rain before it came, but yeah, I think last year we were at 360, 370. So we were down a little bit. Weather didn't cooperate, but uh, still a good event nonetheless. Okay, excellent. Yeah, it was nice to see the police had the uh, the training the training room open, and that was that was well attended. It was interesting to see Interna without his partner, though. You know, I think there was some disappointment there. It's like, <laughs> where's the dog? <laughs> um, we had an open house on Thursday night for 610 to East River Road. Um, we, had a, we had an open house uh, with the county considering the Foley reconstruction from Coon Rapids Boulevard to East River Road. And then we had an open house with the, with the possibility of connecting East River Road to Highway 610. Um, and I would just really encourage the neighbors down there to stay involved in the process. You know, right now I, I understand, you know, there's, they don't want a road to cut through their neighborhood. I get it. I mean, my, I, I'm the classic example. My folks moved here in 52 and in 1976, we lost our house to a frontage road. You know, it was the house I grew up in. It's the only house I knew. So it's a very emotional thing. But I, in the big picture, it made that area better. Um, and in this case, I guess I would really encourage them to stay involved in the process. And we want to look at the Hanson Boulevard project as an example. Um, the county highway engineer brought in that big proposal for the open house and everybody gave the feedback on it and the neighbors didn't like many elements of it and they just took all of the input and they just rolled it back up. They went back away and they came back and they brought out basically a new proposal that really dealt with a lot of the neighborhood issues as best they can. And, uh, and I guess I really encourage them, we're listening, 
but we really want them to stay involved in the process. And when it's, if we get the engineering money and if we can move forward, there will be a time for all of that input. Um, so I, that was what I wanted to mention about that. Um, okay, any other business? <laughs> Council Member Demmer. Uh, last week, the uh, Coon Rapids uh, High School had their uh, annual biomed student open house, which is one of the things I really like to go to. I'm on the, the committee for the, you know, we, we all divvy up the committees and I was the winner because I got that one. Um, and you know, just a shout out to the the teachers and the students and the parents. Uh, the the proposal or the the projects they do, um, they're really college level projects that that these guys are doing in high school. You know, someone uh, took all the cellular structure out of a spinach leaf. You know, in high school, um, they had a, a project where they were trying to improve the clotting response uh, for blood transfusions. You know, in high school. Um, it, it was it was fantastic, and again, uh, a real credit to the the school district and and the the program they put together there. I felt I felt really accomplished making a breadboard in high school, <laughs> you know. Um, but there was an award given out that night, a significant award, and I don't recall what the award was called, but it was for involvement from from a community member, and that was Councilmember Demmer. You know, I was given that. That was a really nice award, and that was a great honor. So yeah, that was a big surprise. I. Yeah. Yeah, had to give all the kids high fives. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, we, we were there. Uh, um, and actually, a few levels of government were there, um, school board, and then also the uh, 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 at least one state rep was there. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was a, kind of a, a big party for the, the, the accomplishments of the students of the school. Yeah, well, it was definitely worth celebrating. It was tremendous. Um, all right. Do we want to talk about um, with the, the Homes for Generations tour? That was Sunday? That, that was Sunday? Yeah, Mayor and Council. Uh, so in spite of the weather on Sunday, uh, rain, I think we had over 1,000 people that attended uh, the event. So there were six different uh, properties that have gone through, or homes that have gone through the Homes for Generation Two program. Uh, and those homeowners graciously opened up their homes to the public and showcased the work that was done. So we're thankful for that. We're also thankful for the staff that took time on a Sunday afternoon to help out and answer questions. So it was a, another great event. So, so as to not completely scare somebody out of the future, a thousand total for the six homes, correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. That's correct. <laughs> about, about 130 in one home and I think close to 190 in the other. So not a thousand throughout all six, but <laughs> that would be a lot. And it was, it was, we went through all six on Sunday and all the homeowners just were so gracious and the projects were so nice and uh, it's just, it's, it's so wonderful to have that, that amount of investment and, and I love talking to them. You know, well, we used to live here in Coon Rapids, then we moved here in Coon Rapids and, you know, it's, I don't know, I, I, I like to hear that A little community spirit there. Um, all right. Any other business to come before council? Councilmember Geisler? Friday is our first movie in the park. Um, so that is Goosebumps 2. So, you know, if we want everyone to start, kids kicks off the Memorial Day weekend, right? And so that um, is going to be at Sand Creek and at 8.30 p.m. because I think it just has to get dark enough to be able to actually see the movie. But it's a free event, so and there's all of the great um, play structures and fields there with that re reworked park so encourage people to go see that on friday night and even though it's 48 and raining now we're <laughs> guaranteeing beautiful weather friday evening right yeah. all right all right yeah this is memorial day weekend um can i mr H mr anderson any updates from the golf course <laughs> yeah. i love that you sit through the whole meeting you know so tell us <laughs> I'm a glass half full person, right? But uh, uh, normally it's filled with optimism. <laughs> I would say that rain has infiltrated that cup significantly. So I, I don't know if you can do an ordinance, you know, outlawing rain between <laughs> 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. If you can, please. Um, it'd be nice if it would stop uh, in the middle of the day. But I, I guess that's that's the only complaint I would have because there's a lot of exciting things happening at Bunker Hills too. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, our junior program is right around the corner in June. We always look forward to that. Junior lessons and leagues. Um, if folks are interested in that, there is still some availability. They can go into BunkerHillsGolf.com and online store and register for that. 
And then uh, the last bunker renovation, the final phase has been completed. Uh, we dodged the weather pretty good with that one. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous, it was a great project, and those bunkers will, this may make people happy or sad, those bunkers will be in play uh, within the next two weeks. So. Excellent. As, not being a golfer, I wouldn't see the bunkers, except you just did the bunkers near the clubhouse, right. and they look awesome. They look just wonderful, yeah. Nice, all right, any other business? Come before council? Councilmember Griscoviak, you got your finger up there. No, I thought Matt had something. I thought the oh. administrator had something. Just going to mention moving the park, which you have to have. Oh, yes. Yeah. You're just going, can we get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other business? Move to adjourn. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Demmer to adjourn. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We're adjourned. Aye.